Thank you so much. Let me get started. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Coming from a family of 18 boys and girls, my mother told us and taught us never to put any more food on the plate than what you can eat. I try to do that with preaching, never read more than what I'm going to get to. Genesis 1, 26. And God said, let us make man. That's enough right there. Thank you so much. You may be seated. God's plan, God's plan. There was a senior sage sister in a kitchen preparing a delicious, delightful, delectable meal for dinner. She had a six-year-old grandson in the kitchen with her irritated her, wanting her attention. She would give him an assignment, but because he was so in love with Grandma, he would rush and do it and come right back. She said to him, carry out the garbage. He rushed, carried the garbage out, came right back. She said to him, go in the other room and make up your bed. He went and made the bed up and came right back. She looked around the house to see if she could find something that could occupy his time and attention while Grandma cooked. She saw a puzzle with a picture of a globe of the world. She took that puzzle, scrambled it up, gave it to grandson, said, go in the other room and Put this puzzle together while Mama is preparing dinner. Five minutes he came back with the puzzle complete. Grandma sat down and said, Baby, how in the world could you put together a picture of the whole world in five minutes? He said, what I did, Grandma, I turned the picture over on the back side. And on the back side was a picture of a man. He said, all I did was put him in place and the world fell in place. If you ever get man in place, then the world will fall in place. There's a Hebrew word called bara. It's mentioned three times in Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis 1 and 1, Genesis 1, 21, and Genesis 1, 27. It is our English word, create. In Genesis 1 and 1, he created the firmament. In Genesis 1, 21, he created the bodies of water. In Genesis 1, 27, he created man. After he finished creating what he was going to create, he turned around and started making stuff out of what he created. And when he got ready to make what he was making, he did not spoke to what he was making it from. For instance, when he got ready to bring forth the grass, he spoke to the ground. Earth to bring forth seed yielding after its kind. When he got ready to bring forth fish, he spoke to the water. Bring forth abundance of fish. When he got ready to make man, he spoke to himself. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, whatever he brought it from, it had to stay connected with to keep living. For grass to keep living, 
Grass had to stay connected to the ground. For fish to keep living, fish had to stay connected with water. And for man to keep living, man had to stay connected with God. Now, if you want to kill either all, just pull them up from their environment. If you want to kill grass, pull it up from the ground. If you want to kill fish, take them out of the water. If you want to kill man, separate him from God. God lays things in order from creation. And anytime you want to find out anything about what God's plan is, find out the first time that it was mentioned. And when you find the first time that it was mentioned, it's in concrete. Because Malachi 3 and 6, I am the Lord God, I change not. Hebrews 13 and 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. For instance, the Lord lays the formula for science in the first book of the Bible. The formula for science is time, force, motion, space, matter. Here it is in Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, that's time. God, that's force. Created, that's motion. Heaven, that's space. Earth, that's matter. He lays it out. He tell you in the beginning the matter of marriage. Because he said in Genesis 2.24, for this cause, shall a man leave his father, shall a man leave his, shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave, the word cleave is where you get the word semen, where you get the word glue, where you get the word stuck. It means once you're married, you're stuck. Talk to me somebody that there's no loophole to get you're not here. He sets the tone for marriage, but he also set the consequences for murder. Because in Genesis 4, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and slew him. The word slew in the Hebrew language means slaughter. It means that Cain took his brother, gutted him, cut him up into little pieces, and laid him on the altar. And God came to the situation, and he said, Cain, where is Abel, thou brother? He said, am I my brother's keeper? God said, well, I heard his blood. The Hebrew word for blood is the word dom, but it's in plural form, which means he didn't just hear Abel's blood, he heard Abel's descendants' blood. <laughs> you see, my father, again, he fathered 18 children. If somebody had killed my daddy when he was 18 years of age, he wouldn't have just killed him. He would have killed all of us. And the 18 of us over a period of time have produced five over 500. He wouldn't have just killed him. He would have killed the whole 500. So when a person kills somebody, you don't just kill that one person. <laughs> you kill all of the descendants. Preach Rembrandt. And when God come with judgment, he don't just judge you for the one. He get all of them. He, he sets the tone for marriage, set the tone for murder, but he set the tone for money because Genesis chapter 14 is the first time that tithing is mentioned in the Bible. It was when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek out of an act of gratitude. If that's the case, the first time tithing was brought up was out of being grateful. That's the reason we tied now. It's not because there's a need, but we tied out of an act of gratitude. Have you ever had children that was ungrateful? I don't have to ask you what you did. You started backing up on what you do for them. But if you got one that's grateful, 
If you don't have it, you'll hawk your house to get it for them. Because it is the gratitude that causes a person to respond. Can I say that those of us that are sitting in here now, if anybody ought to be grateful, is us. That you have lived, you have lived through 665,000 people that died in the last 18 months and you still here. If anybody ought to be grateful, it ought to be us. We should rush and not just tell God thank you, we should show him thank you. But he also set the tone not just for marriage, not just, not just for money, but he set the tone for man. Now if you watch Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 25, whatever God did, he just spoke it and it happened. He spoke light up here. He spoke firmament appears. He spoke day and night shows up. He spoke sun, moon, stars shows up. He spoke the fowls began to fly. The fish, fish began to swim. That six day morning, he spoke and the animal kingdom shows up. Talk to me somebody. But then that six day evening, he made man. Now watch it, seven is perfection. He make man on day six, which means he's short of perfection. I don't care who you are, you're still a six. Preach Reverend Ray. When you see people cutting the food, give them a little grace because they are a six. <sighs> Y'all don't like me in this house. He, he makes man on day six. That's a switch in the text. Verse one through 25, he just spoke it and happened. But when he got to man, he called the council together and said, let us. You say, who is us? Well, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God, the Hebrew word for God is the word Elohim. The word Elohim is a plural noun, not like the English language. English language, singular mean one, plural mean two or more. But in the Hebrew language, singular mean one, dual mean two, three mean plural more, three or more. So in the beginning, he said, at least three or more created the heaven and the earth. You say, well, that's, that to me is just God in Genesis 1. Let's just say, in the beginning, God, that's the Father. John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the Word. <laughs> and John 1, 14, and the Word was made flesh. We know that's the Son. Genesis 1, verse 2 say, and the Spirit moved. That's the Holy Spirit. They were together in creation, the Father, Son. He said, let us. The Father said, I will make man. The Son said, I will save man. The Holy Spirit said, I will keep man. They were together in creation. Let us make man in our image, which means man is an ex of the presence of God. That's why you have to watch yourself because some people will never read your Bible, but they'll read you. Man is an extension of the presence of God. You know how when you're in the house trying to paint and you're too short to reach the ceiling, you get a you extension on your brush to reach what you couldn't reach. Man is God's extension. Ephesians 2 and 10 said we are his workmanship. The Greek word for workmanship is the word poema, where you get the word poenis from, where you get the English word poem. A poem is a work of art. <laughs> and whenever you do a work of art, you don't hide it under the bed. You don't put it in the closet. You put it on display so everybody can see your work of art. 
You see, man is God's billboard. <sighs> he makes him in his own image. Genesis 2, 7, tell us how he made it. He said he formed him from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostril the breath. Hebrew word is ruach, R-U-A-C-H, stands for wind, breath, and spirit. Man became a living soul. See, man is a trichonomist. He is body, he's soul, he's spirit. Body deal with world consciousness. Soul deal with self-consciousness. Spirit deal with God consciousness. The body looks out. The soul look in. The spirit look up. Thank God for the body. When he made man's body, he gave him 263 bones, 600 muscles, 970 miles of blood vessels, 32 feet of intestines, 32 teeth in his mouth, eyes like cameras every time they flash, take a picture, send it to the brain to be developed. A heart that beat from 60 to 80 times a minute on an average of 72 times per minute. A tongue with 400 cups that can pick up the sweets and the sours. 20,000 tainted hairs in his ear that can pick up the high and the low. 26 bones in his feet, 27 bones in his hand represent the 27 books of the New Testament. Psalms 100 says, it is he that have made us. And when God made man, he put mobile sails on the inside. White sails and red sails. The white sails are large in number but smaller in size. The red sails are large in number but smaller in size. White sails are larger in size, smaller in number. Here's how they work. I'm in the backyard working on a project. I got a hammer and nail. I miss the nail and hit my finger. Instantly, a swell show up. The swell is the emergency of the white sails. The white sails come, and they literally die for the recovery of my finger. In a few days, you'll see pus is the death of the white sails. Once they die for the recovery of my finger, they email the red sails. The red sails come and clean up the mess the white sails made, and in a few days, I'm healed. Talk to me, somebody. Because it is he that have made us. He's concerned about your body. Romans 12 and 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, know you're not, you're not your own. You have been glorified. Glorify God in your body. He's concerned about your body. Matter of fact, he's so concerned about your body, he tell you what you do with every member of your body. When my eyes will take Psalms 1, lift them toward the hill, from which cometh my help, my help comes from the Lord. When my ears will take Matthew 11 and 15, he that have ears to hear, let him. When my mind will take Philippians 2 and 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. With my heart and mouth, I take Romans 10 and 10. For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. With my hand, I take Ecclesiastic 9 and 10. Whatsoever thou hand find to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, no device, no wisdom, no knowledge in the grave where thou goest. With my knees, I take Philippians 2 and 10 at the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow. With my feet, I take Hebrew 12 and 1, laying aside every weight and sin, which do it so easily set us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. He's concerned about the body. But the body has temporarily stamped on it. That means we didn't come here to stay. Do I have a witness? 
You can be in your adolescent age, your tender teens, your teachable twenties, your tireless thirties, your forcible forties, your fevered fifties, your seasoned sixties, your cell seventies, your aching eighties, your benevolent nineties, or your prodigious hundreds. We gonna check out of here. It's concerned about, let us make man in our image an extension of the presence of God, and after our likeness, let him have the expression of God. That means I must look like God. Romans 8, 29 says, Whom he did foreknow, they may also predestinate, be conformed to the image of his son. You see, God was so in love with his son that he decided to populate the world with folk that look just like his boy. And when God spots something in you that don't favor his son, he performs surgery on you. Now what I love about God is that while he's working on me, he cover me. So you can't see what he's doing. We got any hip in here with me. But when God gets through with us, Goldsmith, when they go dig up gold, they put it in a pot and put fire on that. And they turn the fire up. <laughs> Y'all got a minute of that one yet. Turn the fire up. And then the goldsmith keep looking in the fire, in the pot. And when he can't see pure gold, he turned the fire up a little harder. He can't see it, he's a little hotter. And when the gold is pure, he can see the reflection of his face. God put us in the pot. He turned the fire up under us. Not because he want to hurt us, but he want to see the reflection of his face. When he can't see his face, he turned it up a little hotter. Can't see it? He turned it up a little harder. When he can see his reflection, he know he got you where he wants you. When God gets through working on us, we will all be standing together. Jesus will be standing in the midst of us. The angels will be out there hunching each other, saying, which one is Jesus? Because when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Do I have a witness? Let us make man our own image and extension of the person of God. After our likeness, man is an expression of the person of God. Let him have dominion. Man should be an exhibit of the power of God. In other words, you're not powerless. We talking about, I beat the devil running, you ain't got to beat the devil running. Submit to the Lord, resist the devil, and he will do the running. Do I have a witness? Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came, speaks of all power. We call this exorcia, which means authority. Acts 1 and 8 says, you shall receive power. The Greek word is dunamis when you get the word dynamite. Ephesians 6 and 10, find my brother be strong in the Lord and the power. The Greek word is kratos, that's demonstrated power. Heal my church, Greek word for church is ekklesia. He get his ekousia, which is his authority, places it behind his ekklesia, which is his church, then get his dunamis and put in the church. Tell the church to seize the opportunities which are before the church. Which means the church can do two things. You can direct, but you can destroy. You can direct divine authority, but you can destroy demonic authority. That's why prayer is so important. Do I have a witness? Everything about your life have been planned by God. He plans the dawn of your life. 
What you mean? God decided when you would be born. Oh, y'all don't hear me. <laughs> you, you need a script for Jeremiah 1 and 5. Before you was formed in your mother's belly, peace, I knew you. Peace, I sanctified you. He said, I ordain you. It wasn't your mom and daddy having fun. God planned the dawn of your life. You know, it's Old Testament. Well, let me give you a New Testament. Ephesians 1 and 4 said, according to whom he has chosen. We're chosen is an avertent. That means God acted alone without a Supreme Court, without a board of directors. But it's not only in our tent, but in mill voice, what he mean he acted by himself, but for himself. That means you was chosen by God, but chosen for God. Well, when did the election take place? Same verse said, it was before. The foundation of the world. That means the birth certificate on your birth certificate ain't really your birth certificate. You see, what messed us up is that for us to keep up with time we have to cut time in the segments yesterday today tomorrow was is and shall be but yesterday is in the tomb tomorrow is in the womb yesterday is a cancel check tomorrow is a promise every note yesterday is history tomorrow is mystery yesterday is recollection tomorrow is speculation but with God everything is an eternal now with God yesterday is now. With God today is now. With God tomorrow is now. You see, God never have to leave anywhere to get anywhere. He's already where he's going and still where he was. Y'all do know about God, don't you? God is so awesome to there are some things about God that God himself has never seen. God has never seen a situation he could not solve. God had never seen a sinner that he could not save. God had never seen a substitute for his son. God had never seen a sinner that could save himself. David said, can I say something? What you want to say, David? He said, well, I've been young. Now I'm old. He said, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or the seed begging for bread. Talk to me, somebody. He planned the dawn of your life. But he also planned the design of your life. What you mean? That God decide if you're going to be a man or a woman. It wasn't the genes in your daddy. Nor in your mama. God decided if you're going to be a man or a woman. Can I tell y'all for free today? Whatever way God designed you, stick with the design. If God makes you a man, stay a man. If God makes you a woman, stay a woman. Legend has it, a lady went to the Lord, said, Lord, grant me long life. The Lord said, it is done. She was so excited. The Lord told her she was going to live a long time. She went, sewed on some new hair. She had her lips redone. Had her ears straightened up. She had a breast reduction. Had a tummy tuck. In other words, she moved some stuff from the front to the back. She bleached her face, walked out in front of a car, car ran over and killed her. Legend have it, when she got to heaven, she went running up to the Lord, said, Lord, you told me I was going to live a long time. You let me get run over by a car. What you do that for? The Lord said, I didn't recognize you. God design you. Stick with the design. 
He plans the dawn of your life. He planned the design of your life. But he also planned the ditches in your life. Y'all don't hear me. You see, because there's a thing called ditch theology. Some stuff you learn in a ditch, you won't learn in a university. I can tell just as good when I run into a person that ain't been in no ditch. They walk by you like they don't even see you. They don't have enough sense to speak to you if they hadn't been in a ditch. But when they've been through the ditch, you run into them, they say, oh, God bless you. <laughs> so happy to see you. Talk to me, somebody. If you've been in a ditch, you don't have to beg them to come to church. If you've been in a ditch, you ain't got to make them read the scripture. If they've been in a ditch, you ain't got to tell them, shake hands and give everybody a high five. They come in here. Shouting and praising the Lord. <laughs> Have I got anybody in here this morning been in a ditch? Because the ditch will do two or three. Number one, a ditch will send you to the scripture. A ditch will have you on your knees praying. A ditch will have you showing up at church before the doors open. <laughs> have I got a witness? Not only does he plan your ditch, he designed the ditch for you. <laughs> there was God know what ditch I need before I get to the ditch. <laughs> I got to let y'all go. <laughs> he plans the dawn. He plans the design. He planned the ditches, but he also planned your destiny. Can't nobody block your blessing but you. Y'all don't hear me. Can I say it again? Can't nobody stop you from being blessed but you. Paul said in Romans 8, 37, we are more than conqueror than conquer it. It's one word, three, four words in English, but it's one word in Greek, hupa nakao. Hupa mean under. Nakao means to conquer. It comes from the idea of one climbing Mount Olympic. They would climb the mountain the best they could. Some would stop along the way some would get almost to the top and throw in the towel but if you made it to the top of the mountain they would raise your hand and declare you are a conqueror but you had to go back down again the second time when you got to the foot of the mountain they put a load on you and you had to climb the mountain with a load. Some because of the load, they would throw in the towel. Others because of the load, they couldn't go any further. But if you was able to make it to the top of the mountain with a load on, they'd raise your hand again and say, you're more than a conqueror. Some people have uh, been climbing this mountain uh, and you made it to the top without a load because you was born with a silver spoon in your hand. But I'm talking to somebody here, you've struggled all your life. If it wasn't one thing, it was something else. But you kept on climbing. Folks see your glory, but they don't know your story. The Lord will look at you and say, You're more than a cockerel. Have I got a witness here? I got one more, I'll let you go. He planned the dawn, He planned the design, He planned the ditches, He planned your destiny, but He also planned your death. Have I got a witness? At the time for you to check out of here. Oh, y'all don't believe me. Hebrew 9, 27. Uh, Say so it is appointed to oh Lord, uh, once for man to die. Do I need to say it again? Uh, 
It is a point once for man to die. And that means there is an appointed day set for every one of us in here. And maybe you need another scripture. Revelation 1.18. He said, I'm he that liveth. I was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. And watch what Jesus said. I got the key of death in my hand. You know what the key will do. It will lock and it will unlock. That means God decided when he's going to let you go. I'm looking at somebody. You had a heart attack, but you sitting right in here. But you know some folk had heart attacks and they sleep in the in a cold grave. Why is it you still here? Because the Lord didn't turn the key. Have I got a witness? I'm looking at somebody. You had a stroke to bounce back, but you know folks that had strokes didn't make it through the morning. I know some people uh, that got shot uh, and died before they got to the hospital. Uh, but I know some other folk uh, that got shot uh, and they still sing and praise us uh, under God. Uh, can I tell you why? It's because Jesus hold the key. That's why every morning when I get up, uh, the first thing I said to the Lord, Thank you for not turning the key because I know I deserve to be dead. But that God of mine, he held the key in his hand. I'm out of here now. Anybody know the, the God I serve? need to holler in here now. Uh, uh, he will uh, want you. Yes, uh, I'm through with y'all. Uh, it is sad uh, that a young boy went to a little corner store uh, with his mother. Uh, when he walked in the store, the, the store owner said to the little boy, Reach your hand in this barrel uh, and get your hand full of candy. Uh, little boy said, no, thank him. Uh, he said, son, uh, mama's going to be here a while. Uh, reach your hand in and get your hand full of candy. Uh, little boy said, no, thank him. Uh, the man said it a third time, son, I know you lack candy. Uh, reach your hand in the barrel. Uh, and get your hand full of candy. Little boy said, no, thank you. And then the stone reached his hand in the barrel and gave the boy candy. On the way home, the mother said, son, you embarrass me. You know you love candy. The man told you to help yourself, but you turn him down. Why did you do that, son? Say, Mama, you don't understand. The stoner's hands, they're bigger than mine. When I put my hand in, I just get one little handful. But when the stone uh, put it in his hand, uh, I get a whole armful. Uh, can I tell you, your hands, uh, they're no match for the Lord's hand. Uh, I stop to tell you, uh, whatever it is uh, you're dealing with, uh, put it in uh, the hands of the Lord. Uh, is he all right? Uh,
got a plan for you. God have planned your life. Hallelujah for the Lamb. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Hallelujah for the Lamb. The door of the church is open. Invitation is extended. You hear out of church, straight away, never accepted Christ as your savior. This is a wonderful time to say yes to the Lord right now. One day you'll have to answer to God from questions that he will ask you. Where will you spend eternity? Is it well with your soul? You'll have to give an account. The Lord is ready to receive you right now. And he's willing, he's able to do it. You're out of church. You're violating the law of the Lord. Hebrew 10, 25 says, forsake not to assemble yourself in the congregation of the Lord. God requires it. Hallelujah for the Lamb. I am so disturbed that when you travel, every place you go is jam-packed with God's house. Football arenas, jam-packed. Grocery stores, jam-packed. House parties, jam-packed. Restaurants, jam-packed. Liquor stores. People are afraid to come to the place that God has assigned us to. This is your chance, your privilege. If you're here today, come on, wherever you are, come on, come on, from all over the house. Come on, the Lord wants you. The Lord loves you. He's concerned about you. He wants you saved. He wants you to live a life that's pleasing in his sight. He's already planned what he wants to do with your life. But you have to let go and let go. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. This is the day that the Lord has made. You should rejoice and be glad in it. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? He wants you. He loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Somebody shout glory in this house. Hallelujah for the Lamb.